Heavenly Father, forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wash us through the blood of the Lamb, we pray. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Pastor Guebo says he is Pastor Guebo says he's on his way. He's just busy with a visitation. He will be with us shortly. All right, that is fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, that communication. Uh, uh, and James is has got malaria. He's very sick oh, at the moment. Shame, James. We hope you get back. I'm, I'm, I hope they look at this card. You must show them this card and let them see what uh, we're about, uh, or what I'm about, and the services I render, and uh, pass it on so that we can help achieve or turn this world upside down with the art of persuasion. Can you believe it? James joined even though he's sick. He is on his way. There you go. Congratulations, James. James is joining well us done. even though he's got malaria. I'm happy. Um, and so what I'll do is those who do attend promptly, I'll give them extra marks. And those who do not attend will, even from the marks they have, lose some of the marks. How's that? Uh, following the biblical principles, it says unto him, uh, those who have, he who has much, much will be given to him. Who he has little, even that will be taken from him. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I want to read something for you. And, and there's Joseph I... also. Joseph is also here. Excellent. Well done, Joseph. Uh, I just would like to read to you something. And before I start reading, I would like to tell you that I have yesterday finished read the entire Bible. Yesterday I did that. I read the entire Bible and I started, I started off uh, from page to page. So yesterday was the day in which I finished. So what I did is I started reading after finishing, I started reading on. Started reading the book of Matthew, and now I'm Matthew chapter 6. So what I do is, uh, when I read the Bible, the entire Bible finish, I mark and I sign. Then I read it, and I read this one, then it finished and I sign. And then, by God's grace, I hope to read it finished again, and then I'll sign again. The whole idea is... A preacher ought to know his Bible. Cannot talk about what you don't know. What is that in thine hand? Now, I read something that is interesting to me or reignited the preaching. And it says, as I was reading, uh, was it this morning? I read about Jesus. And what does it say about Jesus? It says, preaching. But where did he start preaching? Let's see. After the temptation. You remember chapter 4? Jesus was tempted and after he successfully beat the devil Jesus went about preaching let me read to you Matthew 4 and reading from verse 19 and he said unto them follow me that is when he called uh, the brother Simon and Peter called two brothers. Then they followed him and then he went and he saw the sons of Zebedee who were James and John with their father. They were busy doing some fishing and he said to them, follow me. And they were busy mending their nets. He called them and they immediately left the ship in verse 22 of chapter 4, Matthew chapter 20, I mean Matthew chapter 4 verse 22. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him and jesus went about all galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching 
This is what I was interested in. And Jesus went about all Galilee. Now I had the privilege of going to Galilee in 1995. I went there and I went to the areas there where Jesus preached. And Jesus went preaching in their synagogues. Preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that they were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Now he went to a certain place and I had the privilege of going there on the Mount of the Beatitudes. And the tour guide took us to the top there and it is a very interesting uh, mount in the sense that it has lots of grass uh, that is sort of uh, smooth, like a carpet. And the shape or the typographical setting of that mount of blessings or beatitudes cascades in that fashion. So we were told by the tour guy that the, and Ellen White, that the people or the throng, the multitude would sit and gather down there, rows and rows, and Jesus would sit it high up, and as he would speak or preach the gospel, his voice would then travel, as it were, and echo and re-echo down, and people would then assimilate or hear, take in the messages. And seeing the multitudes in chapter 5, he went up into the mountain, and when he, he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, this is where Jesus uh, preached, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they that are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall seek God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of man. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Carried on, say, think not, and he carried on. But what is beautiful here is that Jesus used an aphora in preaching, a thematic method of sermonizing. Blessed are the poor, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are they which hunger, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they which persecute you. Blessed are ye when men shall revive. This anaphora, it is powerful in homiletics, in preaching. And I was hoping that you would take note when you would have listened to the preaching of 
uh, those men whom I've allowed you to listen to. Now, before I continue, I want to make mention that I am impressed by those of you who are persistent. And it's very interesting that it is a few of you who have a certainty of persistence and doing. I want to congratulate you for that. You deserve uh, me to say that. And may the Lord bless you as and your efforts that you are putting in because preaching is no play game as you already discovered throughout the lessons. I want to say also something that is profound coming from Warren. What is that that comes from Warren? Is that the way he quotes Marshall McLuhan, and I did read it before, in my current doctorate, I am dealing with Marshall McLuhan and Aristotle. He says Marshall McLuhan couches it rather bluntly. The medium is the message. Preacher Philip Brooks inserts that preaching is truth through personality, meaning the authentic self. So if there's anything that I would like you to habituate, brethren, is that you seriously will make a stay in the word of God, that you devote some time to fasting and prayer, serious prayer, and asking the Lord to help you and wrestle with him as Joseph did, I mean Jacob did uh, with the angel and say, I will not leave you until you bless me. That the Lord will imbue a double copious measure of his dunamis, his dynamite, his Holy Spirit, that he will possess you fully and completely, that he will transform the personal character so that wherever you walk, people will see, smell, feel, and hear a preacher. A preacher must be the complete package, not uh, at a certain time you are a preacher and other times you are something else. We do not want a schizophrenic personality, but we want someone who we can say, there is a preacher, a man of God. Sister, I have sent you a sermon uh, that I would like for the saints to listen, the students to listen, by John Stott. John Stott was one of the greatest preachers ever, and I've asked uh, Edmund to please send you his bibliography from the UK. Um, you'll hear from the accent, he's different, um, but one of the most respected preachers um, and who is a student and a diligent exemplar of homiletics that he 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 preaches what he practices <laughs> how's that so sister are you able to play that for us if it doesn't it come out clear we'll stop but i would like you to just play the first 10 minutes and then i want us to discuss there but please make notation taking into account about the constituents of preaching or the canons of rhetoric looking even at such canon as number five as delivery um, listen to content listen to look out for research uh, use of words if there are any greek words and so on but this is a highly respected preacher and he is fall he falls under the preachers that preach for the queen of england 
Did you hear what I said? Uh, this is a high honor in England. But I would like you to please uh, play that for us and let us tune in based on the rhetorical, homiletical studies we've learned thus far and see if we can pick it up. I noticed that there is a heavy emphasis in this passage on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is in fact mentioned by name, directly or indirectly, nine or ten times in these few verses. And in particular, the emphasis is on his teaching role as the Spirit of Truth. Indeed, it seems to me that this is one of the most important passages in the New Testament in regard to the relation between the Spirit and the Word or between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scripture. We all know that Holy Scripture and Holy Spirit are supposed to have something to do with one another because the Holy Scripture is the creative product of the Holy Spirit. And all Christians know that. We say, if we recite the Nicene Creed, that he spoke through the prophets. And we read in the second letter of Peter, chapter 1, verse 21, that holy men spoke from God as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it is the precise relationship between the Spirit and the Word that we're going to investigate in this passage this morning. And the part played by the Holy Spirit in the composition of Scripture. Because we evangelical people acknowledge as one of our main distinctives our submission to the supreme authority of Scripture, this is a very important topic for us today. But before we come to the details, we need first to see the text in its context, a wise hermeneutical principle whenever we are studying Scripture. Everybody agrees that with chapter 2, verse 6, the Apostle Paul's argument changes course. Up to this point, he has been emphasizing the foolishness of the gospel. But now we come to verse 6, where he says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among those who are mature. Now, Paul is not contradicting himself. I may quote from Professor F.F. F. Bruce. In his commentary on 1 Corinthians, he writes, the wisdom Paul now says he proclaims is not something additional to the saving message of Christ crucified, it is in Christ crucified that the wisdom of God is embodied. It consists rather in the more detailed unfolding of the divine purpose summed up in Christ crucified. But although he says we do speak wisdom, he immediately adds three qualifications or three correctives to be sure that he's not misunderstood. A. This wisdom is wisdom for the mature. The teleoi is the Greek word. It's not for the unregenerate. It's not even for babies in Christ that we'll be thinking about tomorrow morning, since it is solid food and not milk. It's solid food that cannot easily be digested. But instead of being for the regenerate or for babes in Christ, it is for mature Christians who are anxious to penetrate into the fullness of the saving purpose of God. So that's A, it's wisdom for the mature. B, it's wisdom from God. It's not the wisdom of this age. It's not human philosophy. It's not the wisdom of the rulers of this age. It's not the wisdom of the world. Beginning of verse 7, it's wisdom from God. Wisdom from God for the mature. And see, it is wisdom designed for our glory. Doxa is the word. Now doxa is an essentially an eschatological word. It refers to our glorification at the end of time and in eternity 
when Christ comes in sheer and utter magnificence and we share in his glory and even our bodies are glorified. So the wisdom of God for the mature is not just good news of our justification, it's good news of our glorification. It alludes to our final perfection as we share in the glory of God. Now all this seems to mean that there is a legitimate difference between our evangelistic message on the one hand and Christian nurture on the other. In evangelism we proclaim the folly of the cross which is the wisdom and the power of God. We resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And through this folly of the preached message, the kerygma or the gospel, God saves those who believe. That's evangelism. And Christ crucified is at the very forefront of our evangelistic message. In Christian nurture, however, building people up into maturity, we want them to understand God's total purpose and especially our forthcoming glorification. This, verse 7, is God's secret wisdom and it can be known only by revelation. And Paul insists on this in verse 9 that all of us know, I'm sure, very well. It's a rather loose quotation from Isaiah 64, verse 4. God's wisdom is something which no human eye has seen, it's invisible, no human ear has heard, it's inaudible, and no human mind has ever imagined, it's inconceivable. It's altogether beyond the reach of our eyes, our ears, and our minds. It cannot be grasped either by scientific investigation or by poetic imagination. It's absolutely unattainable by our little, finite, fallen, and fallible minds. And therefore, if it is ever to be known, only God can reveal it. It will never be known unless it, unless it is made known by God himself, which is exactly what he has done verse 10. Many people stop verse 9, but you must always go on to the beginning of verse 10, that these things that cannot be known by the ear, the eye, or the mind, God has revealed by his Spirit. So let's think for a moment about the necessity of revelation. When the Apostle says that not even human minds have understood it, he's not denigrating the human mind, he is simply saying that the human mind, capable as it is of remarkable achievements in the realm of the empirical sciences, when it is seeking God, it flounders helplessly out of its depth. And the Old Testament equivalent of verses 9 and 10 is surely Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. Here it goes. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. That is to say, the mind, or let me go on a moment, no, no, neither your ways are not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And heaven is higher than the earth. What does that mean? It means infinity. And there is no way by which we can climb up into the infinite mind of God. There is no ladder by which we can climb up. This little mind cannot fathom the infinite mind of God. So how can we know his mind? Answer, we cannot. If he remains silent. We could never even begin to know the thoughts of God in the mind of God unless he had spoken. Well, we cannot even read each other's minds. I don't know what you're thinking at the moment. And if I were to remain silent on the platform now, you wouldn't have the foggiest idea what I was thinking about. Try.
Any idea what I was thinking about? Well, you should guess I was watching birds. <laughs> and I was actually watching the Japanese crane in the fullness of its beauty. But you didn't know that. You hadn't the remotest idea. Now, if we cannot read each other's minds, if we're silent, how much less can we read the mind of God? But God has spoken. You know what is going on in my mind at this moment because I'm speaking to you and I'm communicating the thoughts of my mind by the words of my mouth. That is exactly what God has done, communicated the secret thoughts in his mind by the words of his mouth. He has spoken and that's how we know what he's thinking. So God has revealed it to us by his spirit, verse 10. Us is emphatic in the Greek sentence. And it must surely refer not to all of us. We're not all recip direct recipients of a revelation of God. It must refer to the apostles who were the recipients of divine revelation, not only Paul himself, but by extension his fellow apostles as well. I'm reminded of Ephesians 3 verse 5 where we read that the mystery of Christ, the truth about Christ into which Jews and Gentiles can enter uh, on the same terms, that mystery has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets who are the foundation on which the church has been built. That's Ephesians 3 verse 5 and Ephesians 2 verse 20. So this is the context. We had to introduce this, the uh, theme today by looking at those things. In what follows, Paul gives a comprehensive statement of the Holy Spirit's work as the agent of divine revelation. He is presented to us in four stages, as you'll see in your outline. First is the searching spirit, Second, as the revealing spirit. Third, as the inspiring spirit. And fourth, as the enlightening spirit. Firstly, he is the searching spirit, verses 10 and 11. Notice in passing that this verb, the Holy Spirit is searching the deep things of God, shows quite clearly that the Holy Spirit is personal. You can't go in for search and research unless you've got a mind. And if you've got a mind, you must, be a per you must be a person able to search and research. Every research worker knows that. It's part of their personality that they are searching the truth. So it's true, of course, that computers analyze the data that are fed into them, but true research work requires original investigation and reflection. So because the Holy Spirit is a person searching the deep things of God, we must never refer to him as it. I hope we've grown out of that. He, he is a he, as Jesus made clear in his own teaching. Now this Holy Spirit, because he's a person, has a mind of his own with which he is able to think. And now Paul develops two fascinating pictures to indicate the Holy Spirit's unique qualifications in the work of divine revelation. A, he searches the depths of God. And B, he knows the thoughts of God. A, he searches all things, even the depths of God. Verse 10. Now the verb used there, which means to investigate, is the very same word that Jesus is used, or the Greek translation of Jesus is Aramaic, maybe, when he applied it to the Jews who searched the scriptures. It's the same Greek word, and it refers to diligent study and investigation. And Milton and Milligan, in their famous uh, lexicon, the vocabulary of the Greek New Testament, quote a third century A.D. papyrus in which the searchers, using the same word, are customs officials who rummage about in our baggage, whether we want them to or not. 
Further, the deep things, the Greek word there, became in the second century AD a favorite term used by the Gnostic heretics who claim to have been initiated into the deep things of God. It may be an anachronism. All right. Thank you very much, um, sister. Gentlemen, anything that you have picked up as far as research under the canons of preaching, is there anything that you have picked up that you would like to mention? Let's deal with the heart of the sermon or content. That is the first canon of preaching. What did you pick up under the canon of preaching or the heart of the sermon, the content of preaching? Anything that you picked up from the sermon? I think the content is on the, the Holy Spirit. The function of the of the Holy Spirit. Eh? Yes. Uh, actually, there is where I'm not sure if if am I audible? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes. So, yes. So he was. So, uh, yes, he's talking about the, the 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 work of the Holy Spirit. How he helps. Uh, we can hear you. Carry on. Yes, he, the Holy Spirit actually helps us and in the divine things because in our natural mind the things of the spirit are foolishness. So the Holy Spirit tunes us to understand the divine things because the thoughts of God cannot actually in a natural state understand the thoughts of God. So but with the help of the Holy Spirit then we can understand that. See the quote from this conference Chapter two and uh, I am show is it fifty fifty there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kauter. Thank you. Um, I think what you are getting at is that we have the content which flows through um, is on the information or the material of the sermon, you, you are able to, to pick up what is she talking about, which in this case, you mentioned the Holy Spirit, right? What else, as far as content Jones, or the heart of the sermon? This is a completely, yes, isn't it almost a completely textual sermon where it takes apart this part of text completely and explains it word by word actually it's the other way around it, it, it's an expository sermon an expository sermon is where you will take the text and you'll expose the text that's why it's expository you um you're exposing the text you're telling us the meaning of the text and i didn't want to make mention of this because i want to give you a chance what else, sister, while you're at it, um, under that exposing, exposition of the text, what did you find that, as you were saying, you were tearing apart the text? What, what came forth that, as an element? He just well, explains uh, it very, very well. Okay, Kaya, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Trudy. I sorry to, uh, uh, from my side what I heard uh, him saying he spoke more of the Holy Spirit the way he emphasized can you hear me hello okay but yes we can hear oh, you okay okay on the Holy Spirit from my side is that the more we we learn and study the Bible the more we are able to see he showed us that the more we learn the more we're able to see that the Holy Spirit is not just a wind, it's a person. He has his mind, he's a, he, he, he even intercedes. 
for for the saying so he is a person with his own mind that's what I've, I've discovered and he searches the deep things of god and he helps us in every respect wherever we need help with our prayers and stuff that's what i discovered thanks Sorry, the line is very bad at the moment. Um, this is also all about themes, like he is taking the Holy, not just the Holy, he's taking the Holy Spirit, but he's also talking about um, the whole, all of, um, yes, he's, he's, he's talking about, it's a thematic design. And um, he also uses a lot of points, it says number one this and number one that. So, yes. The network is extremely bad. Doctor, can you hear us? I can hear you today. We've lost uh, the doctor. Think, Let's just give him a chance to get back to box. us. Okay, yeah, I see the screen. Keep, uh, no problem. Yes, of course. Yes, uh, Sister Trude, actually, uh, that's why I would want to understand how is it also expository because as I, I saw how uh, uh, the the teacher there actually i think he, he read from verses six going down of that first Corinthians chapter two and he's explaining that part of the holy spirit especially showing exactly the mind of god uh, that we cannot uh, understand it except that the holy spirit uh, helps us there so if you could help me brethren to differentiate between how is it not textual and it being expository there. Thank you. Okay. Um, a textual sermon will be basically one way you just really quote text. You know, um, you, you will have a whole lot of text quoted uh, around the theme. But um, the expository sermon is where you, you will have, you'll come with a background. Like if you hear the preacher there, he's talking, he gives the background, and that is what I was hoping you, you folk would tell me when I say under the, the first constituent or the content. He gives a background of, of the whole of the text, and he does an excellent work like Sister Trudy said, that he, he tears it apart in the sense that he explains, he explicates, he spends time explaining meaning. And then I was hoping somebody would make mention of, have you taken note that he uses Greek words? He says the word there is teleo, and he mentions another Greek word, and he mentions a few Greek words. This man has done research. So in your sermon that I will require you to draw up, later on because you are going to draw up sermons and i want to see i want to show you or you will be able to show yourself what your sermon now looks like versus when you first came and joined this class i want to believe there's going to be a remarkable difference and in your sermon i want to see that you have you're going to tell me some meaning of the word and put some greek there if it's a New Testament uh, text, if it's an Old Testament, I want to see some Hebrew. But the preacher there, I was hoping that you take a note, he uses some Greeks. He's, he's, he's explaining. That old man did some serious work there. 
and we've got to we've got to appreciate him. He knows what he's talking about, and you can see he's confident on the pulpit. Am I correct? All right, he is confident. Definitely. And he is calm. Why? Because he's done some thorough research. All right, that is in terms of the heart of the sermon. What about um, the design? Hmm. What have you noticed? Anything about design that you pick up? Or structure? Talk to me. I want to know that you, what you have uh, learned. It's a thematic to... design. Sorry, doctor. It's a thematic design. Or let me put it this way. What about the, the org org organization? The eye of the sermon. Because that's the design. It almost looks like he's covering uh, the sermon in points. Is it covering it in, in some points, uh, breaking it down? Uh, by point, yeah, I, uh, yes, point yeah, thank you very much. Well done, well done. Thank you very much. He does that. He, he gives an introduction, and he does read his text before that, and he breaks it down into points. So we, there are points. He mentions A and B and C. Well done. Well noted. Now, and I'm so happy that you picked that up, Kaya. Here is a man who is internationally highly regarded. Um, you'll see his portfolio. He was listed as one of the f uh, best 10, the best 10 most influential men. Huh? And Kaya, he is following the homiletical principles. Let us say, because I'm a great man, a great preacher, and just come there and just uh, talk. No, he follows the science, and that's what makes him so powerful. What I'm again want to say to you is that if you follow these principles, it will be noted in your sermons. Um, influential people, the learned and the unlearned, will see that here's a man who knows his subject matter well. Here is a man who knows what he's doing. Anything else that you notice? I want uh, on the language. What did you pick up on the language? On the language, did you pick up anything? I don't think I listened oh, close enough to pick up anything think about language. <laughs> There is somewhere where he mentioned the, the line of anaphora where he was busy. It is not, it is not, it is not. Yes. I think it's where he talks about the, 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 the wisdom or something. It is not this, it is not this. That's what yes. I could pick up. There. Yes, he does use anaphora. And what else does he use? I heard there something like imagination. Imagination. Explanation, something like that. Do you remember that? That's param, paranomasia. Mm. Uh -huh. So you must always look out of these things because what I'm trying to show you again is that the preacher, those things are not coincidental. A preacher of that caliber knows what he's doing. It's not intentional. I mean, it's not uh, accidental. It is intentional. Okay. So he is not using callous language is well chosen. He uses familiar symbols and he uses uh, plain language and he, um, he he makes sure that he has cutting, reproving uh, language. Language that uh, is carefully chosen. Words that are, are carefully chosen that the uneducated also can understand. And if I'm not mistaken, I heard also there a simile. I heard similes there. But thank you very much. Um, and then when it comes to um, delivery, what did you notice? 
What have you noticed in the under delivery? I think before we go to Is delivery, it? before we even go to delivery, let's say memory. What 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 have you noticed about memory? Is he not using some manuscript there? It looks like there's something Thank which you. he's looking at in front. Thank you. Thank you. So he's using a manuscript. So he, and what he's doing there in terms of manuscript is that he, you can see that he drops his eye and, and he looks at the audience, but he does sort of, he reads, you know, uh, but he's internalized the message. I think you notice there, Kaya, that he, He's comfortable. He's not struggling. He's not searching. He's not fumbling. Why? Because of the memory, he's an internalized his message. He has eye contact with his audience. Thank you. Well noted. That is under memory. Now, under delivery, what did you pick up? Anybody? What did you pick up under delivery? Hmm? Firstly, well, let's talk about uh, his dress. Is <laughs> represents him very well. You know that you can see he's a preacher to start with. Then number two, when we look at now how he speaks, I think under delivery, I'll, I'll talk about his pronunciation of words is clear enough, and the pitch, you know, of the sound. You could you can hear his. His voice as he, he, he pronounces and he's so slow, so in such a way that you can hear the message out. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you. Very well done. So we, we talk about voice whenever we, he, uh, he's got good control of his voice there and he speaks clearly, which Ellen White says that he should speak clearly, a preacher must speak clearly. She says, students who expect to become workers in the cause of God should be trained to speak in a clear, straightforward manner. That's what Ellen White says. So, and he does that. And what about the apparel of the preacher also in a sermon? The very dress will be a recommendation of the truth to unbelievers. How is he dressed? This is what Ellen White says. She says the very dress will be a recommendation of the truth to unbelievers. This is his vis your visible code or non-audible code, right? Yes, yes, How yes. yes. Actually, that's what I've said to say. Him wearing the formal clothes there makes you want to listen to him to say he's serious, someone in serious business. Thank you. And the sermon itself, I, in everything pertaining to the preacher, you said it well, you said he does look like a preacher, right? Very he looks well like done. somebody knows, that knows what he's talking about. He actually yes. looks like somebody that knows what he's talking about. Yes. And does he have feeling? Yes, he does. And he has, uh, and, and he, he, there is a power in expression. We can see that he's he, he has, and we see how he's connected with his audience. You saw how they responded and, and they laugh and the humor that he uses there, the anecdote is natural. It stems forth from the scripture. It is not like going to look for a joke and put it in. It is something that it is natural. Correct. Correct. Right. Sister, Trudy. Okay, I'll play the next one. Please play the next one. Please play the next sermon. This is by Charles Bradford. The blessings of God be upon you. This evening, we've had a, quite a day today. And uh, some of us are far spent. 
the tank is almost on E. And I don't know about you, I could stand a little replenishment by now. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord's name has been praised in this place. I'm convinced that you are a chosen people. God has brought you together and it would be wonderful if all God's people were here in this place because it has been good to be here. If you work in IT, you need to Terra, an all-in-one remote monitoring and management solution to run your entire IT operation smoothly. Just mighty fine to be here. I foolishly announced my sermon. Um. And I'll have to stick with it. <laughs> I gave the subject, I wish I had a praying church. I picked that up from a minister on the radio. I don't know who he is. I don't remember where I was. But I heard the old preacher keep saying, I wish I had a praying church. <laughs> don't you feel that way? As we go through troublous times, heavy seas, <clears throat> We could all wish we had a praying church. The old song has it, somebody prayed for me. I'm so glad they prayed. One verse of it says, they had me on their mind. My mother prayed for me. She had me on her mind. I'm glad to know I'm on somebody's mind. I enjoy with my prideful self when people say, what's a wonderful sermon, I smile. But it's better if you say I'm praying for you. Yeah. That great sermon ain't gonna help me when I really need some help. Yes. And so I'm glad I, I request and crave your prayers. That's an old expression they used to use. I crave your prayers. That means I really appreciate your prayers. I need your prayers. So I want to right now ask our Lord for his presence with us. Dear Father God, we are here. We feel so privileged, Lord, that you spared us and kept us. And, and we uh, have this opportunity to fellowship one with the other. And yes, dear Lord, to pray about the things that really matter. Thank you for that opportunity tonight. And give us that word that will touch the places in our lives that need strengthening and filling in this time as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But you are a chosen people. I don't want to be a triumphalist old-time Adventist who thinks everything we do is right and we have the right to do it. But I am tonight uh, filled with a sense of awe and wonder that I am a chosen people, a part of a chosen people, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a people belong to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Somebody needs to tell us from time to time who we are. We fall into a certain uh, accustomed way, like 
Ellen White calls it, coming and going like a door on its hinges. And we forget that we are indeed the people of God. We're not any little ordinary bunch behind the Lord's back somewhere. And I'm not trying to give you, infuse any false pride into you, but it ought to spring, put a spring in my step when I think I'm a child of God. I'm a part of the family of God. Out in lonely places, all of you people travel a great deal. Nobody knows you. You're traveling from here to there. You stay in places, strange sounding names, but never forget you are a chosen people. No matter where you find yourself, you're chosen. I remember, I remember right on this campus, as a kid, young boy, young fellow, Vesper service in the old-fashioned Oakwood way, when the music wafted over the trees and sounded down through the farm and the dairy, and the quick work bell rang before sundown, and you quicken your steps because even the wildest kid on campus wanted to go to Vesper. Yes. He may not have wanted to go to 11 o'clock service or Sabbath school, but he wanted to be in Vespa. So he ran to be in Vespa. And this evening, Mrs. E.I. Cunningham was speaker. She stood up. She could look through you. <laughs> she began talking. Like many teenagers, I was trying to find my way. Not quite sure who I was or what I wanted to do with my life. And dear Sister Cunningham looked right through me. But she was looking at me. She saw something in me as she warmed to her theme, the great untapped potential of youth. She looked at me and said, Charles, you're wonderful, but you just don't know it. Now that's the worst thing she could have said on Oakwood's campus. For the next several weeks, people would meet me and say, Charles, you're wonderful, but you just don't know it. <laughs> of course, I was embarrassed in front of all those snickering students, but I could have said, thanks, I needed that. Indeed, Israel needed someone to tell them who they were. Keep them reminded of who they were. This ragtag group of ex-slaves on a journey that they didn't quite understand, Yahweh instructed Moses. He said to him, this is what you ought to say. Talk to the people, the house of Jacob, and, and tell them this. Tell Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Somewhere it says a peculiar people, that's all right. But it's a treasure that he possesses. And although the earth is mine, he says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. That's Exodus 19, 4, 5, and 6, NIV. And, and the New Testament people need to hear it too. I don't care who you are or what age you, in, you find yourselves in, what time you find yourselves in, you too need to be reminded. As uh, they, we used to get on the kids lallygagging around just sauntering through life. Somebody needs to slap you a little bit on your cheek and say, hey, wake up. You're a child of the king. Amen. We may not want to hear it at that time, but there will come a time when you'll be happy somebody said it to you. This diverse crowd of Jews and Gentiles, they were called the offscouring of the earth cultured Jews and sophisticated pagans looked down their nose at them. They, they were the nobodies of the world. They, they came out of horrid slums, projects or whatever they lived in in those days. 
It was an awful situation from which they had come because the common people heard him gladly. Not many wise men, not many great government officials respond to your meetings and your evangelistic efforts. I'm bringing it home to you now. Think how from night to night the lowly people come. But the preacher will have to recognize that in these lowly people, there are souls who are precious in God's sight. And even if they don't have the latest Fifth Avenue clothing on their backs, they still are somebody. And in and, and one of the, poor, one of the uh, plays of Shaw, he had this girl transformed by this man into a beautiful lady. And somebody said, how did he do that? He said, she said, when you treat me like a lady, then I act like a lady. <laughs> you may say your congregation is a little rough aged and, and they don't have the niceties and fineries and all the rest of that, but treat them, treat them like they were royalty. These are God's people. Don't beat them up. Don't throw stones and gravel in their face. Lift them up. Tell them, you are child of God. You are the apple of his eye. Treat them like a lady, and they will act like a lady. Now, God's spokesman, you men and women, are trying to tell people who they are. Jesus has chosen them to be his assistants in his priestly ministry. I'm an assistant priest to Jesus Christ. Now, it would be a great honor. I just went here in the, in the uh, pastor's study. Everybody helped me. I wanted this, I wanted that, I wanted the other, all these assistants. I said, this is a great job to have to be the assistant pastor in a church like this. But brethren, don't put me down. I'm retired. I'm way out on in nowhere. But yet, I'm still an assistant priest to whom Jesus, the great high priest, I'm his assistant and I help him in his ministry. So here I go. May not have a dime to rub against another dime, but I am a priest of God. I can pray for you and the Lord will hear me. You didn't. <laughs> I got something to offer you that the world cannot offer you. We always need to come back now to the basic statements and documents. He said, you're lively stones. You built up a spiritual house, your holy priesthood, and you offer up spiritual sacrifice, sacrifices acceptable to God. So how can that be humdrum? How can I compare? because the brethren sent me down to Chidlin switch. Well, well. <laughs> Somebody said they put you on the Isle of Patmos. Yes, <laughs> One brother told me the conference committee got it in for me. Yes. They moved me. I was doing well where I was. He even had his wife to come and see me. And I couldn't help him a bit. I'm not an administrator in the work of God, but he was so upset about it. And I had to think, no matter where you go, if there are people there, you are still the assistant minister to Jesus Christ. I feel like putting it on my calling card. Charles Bradford, old man, preached for 60 some years, but he's still a child of the king. Yes, I'm an assistant to Jesus Christ in his priestly ministry. And you know, the church is a marvelous agency. In the economy of salvation, for the accomplishment of God's purposes. Here's what Paul says in one place. He says, Ephesians 3, 10, 11, he says, his intent was, this is God's intent now, through the church. He didn't say through CNN, uh -huh. Come on, man. ABC, uh -huh. CBS, yeah. sure wasn't through Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be careful here, but I got my crowd with me. I got, I got my homeboys here with me here. 
he, 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 his intent was that through you, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Yes. To whom? To the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes. I had an old buddy, Sam Myers. Yes. Sam used to call me fat. I call him fat. Fat for fat. And Sam said, Brad, I like that word you used the other day. What was it? He said, ambassador's plenipotentiary. <laughs> I said, tell me that again, Sam. He said, ambassador's plenipotentiary. I went away from there saying to myself, I'm an ambassador, not just ordinary, but plenipotentiary. <laughs> Now these may sound like high, sound, high sounding words from the pen of this man, Paul. He, he saw it more clearly than any of us, expressed it more eloquently than any other. But this is just how God sees it. He sees us as his assistants. Yeah. I called you. I got this one for you now. I called you and I installed you. This theme is so big, it's so manifold. How can we ever expect to grasp it? We can never fully comprehend it. Can't get my arms around it, but we can look at it one aspect at a time. It may be helpful to look at the church as the people of God at prayer. No dearer group to the heart of God than the people who come together in prayer the praying church so Paul says I'm reading here I urge then first of all first item on the agenda first of all that request prayers intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone don't narrow your prayers down to me and my house and my son John his wife us for no more Preach, yeah, pray. Pray for all in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. People who are content with the simple things of life, not needed to be stimulated by a whole lot of foolishness, not living in a Barnum and Bailey world. Don't have to have sweet lies put to music so it can cool you to sleep. But people who live quiet lives in all godliness and holiness, Paul says, this is good. This pleases God our Savior. And Paul is speaking to the church now, gathered, the church gathered, a worshiping, witnessing community. The church is in, united in prayer and Jehovah's awful throne. Don't you love that song? Before Jehovah's awful throne, we all together kneel in prayer. The church united in prayer. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. And always, Paul says, always the first item on the agenda is prayer. This coming together of people who follow Jesus is an awe-inspiring event. And prayer is the defining activity. What's going on here? What's going on here? The church of Jesus Christ is more than just a group of people coming together because they like each other on the basis of their ability to get along well together. My kind of people, we love each other. We play tennis and all that and bowl together and have common interests or who have special insights even into religious genius as religious genius. Uh, these are ordinary folk from every walk of life but in spite of their ordinariness they are actually priests of God priests of God and priests offer sacrifices that's what they do priests offer sacrifices Hebrews 13 verse 15 through Jesus therefore this is the NIV let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. 
the fruit of lips that confess his name. That's why I say I wish I had a prayer in church. It's amazing, it's mind boggling. God has made this church his partner. Laborers together with God in the work of salvation, we scarce can take it in. The community is authorized to do business as the kingdom of God. I've been privileged to sit around with some of these great administrators and, and hospital uh, uh, execs and, and CEOs, and I hear them talking their, their lingo, and one, uh, one of the sayings is DBA. Now, I've sat on boards and committees for years. I didn't know what DBA is. Finally, I got up enough courage to ask the top dog at the hospital, what does this word DBA mean? He says that means doing business as. Now, that's one of those terms from the business world, a big Fortune 500 company sees an entrepreneur really going big and takes him under their wing and gives him a title and the, the, the right to do business as the big company. You understand what I'm saying? And so here we are, little old bitty folks down here. But we are part, we, we, we know the CEO of the top firm in the universe. Come on now. Come on. And so he tells us, go on out and do business as the kingdom of God. <laughs> you can do business in my name. That's what he said, everything in my name. I gave you a check with my name on it. I inscribed every promise with my name. Nothing can fail when it has my name. You can do business as the kingdom of God. So don't mess with me. So yes, the people gathered here do business as the kingdom of God. Their worship is not a trivial matter. matter. It's, a, it's serious. It mustn't be taken lightly. This is not a people in a cloister. People who withdraw from the world, getting the, pulling their garments around them, spending all of their time repeating mantras and memorized prayers. Uh, these are ordinary people, they gotta work. They're not on a dole, they have to work. They have to take care of families, engage in earthly pursuits, but when they come together to worship and adore the risen Lord, they are a people transformed. I may be the janitor at the department store, but when I join my brothers and sisters in prayer, I'm a member of the house of God and sons. So in this environment, this setting, there's serious involvement and participation in the ministry of Jesus. Then the question is asked, how shall we pray? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How? Those, this is Acts 2, 41 and on, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 souls were added to their number that day. People say, you're playing the numbers game. All you're doing is going out and have your evangelistic effort and then sending a whole big inflated list to the conference. Playing the numbers game. Well, somebody was counting that day. Huh? Somebody. On the day of Pentecost, somebody was counting, said 3,000. They devoted them, well, they could have said a nice number, couldn't they? They're a pretty good number. But 3,000, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved and we should take note now that new believers in Christ are added to a praying community the moment they're baptized if you don't believe in equality of the believers don't baptize them then huh? 
If you say, why well, been in this meeting because he ain't been in but so long, they don't baptize him. Yeah. All right, now. Come on. All right, now. God is an equal opportunity employer. I, I, I got to be careful here. I don't, I don't want to have no accident here in the pulpit getting too loud and all that stuff. But, but, but uh, he says, uh, as they come to faith, they are incorporated into a body, the body of Christ. The call and the affirmation of Jesus includes incorporation into his church. They are added. They are added. Ellen White says that the, 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 the secret of unity is the equality of the believers. Unless we are all equal, then the body of Christ will suffer. Uh -huh. oh, there must be equilibrium in the body. <laughs> All of the parts of the body must work together. There is a relationship between all of them. One hurts, all hurt. So they are incorporated into the body. They must be treated as equals. Yes, there are no second class citizens in God's family. Amen. We say down, we say down in certain part of the world where I preach. I don't use those words anymore because people say, I'm from that part. You talked about my town. So I don't mention any town or any state, but I was down somewhere and, and I, <laughs> I had to learn the, the lingo of the people. I came from Philadelphia and New York and thought I was sophisticated. I talked, walked fast and talked out of the side of my mouth and so forth and didn't say hello to nobody on the street. And so there I was in a certain town and I walked back and forth as an intern to the church and the people tried to talk to me, but I was, you know, I was uh, just accustomed to, to talking only to the people I know. And so it, sound, it seemed as if I was getting a little as Elder Peterson used the word, you're looking a little hinkty. <laughs> hinkty. And somebody, the word got back to me and said, that young preacher you got there, he doesn't speak to anybody. He doesn't know nobody. What's the matter with, where did you get him? And when they told me, at least I had sense enough to change up and I began shaking hands with everybody in the street. <laughs> Because I wanted to do well in ministry. Anything you told me to do that helped my ministry, I was going to do it. Yes. Even if it hurt me, I was going to do it. Yes, sir. And so the community of saints is called. We can't have Jesus without coming into fellowship with each other. That's why I plan to lay on you here tonight. They do not live apart from each other. Uh -huh. Uh, this is true about all those who are being saved. That's what it said, they who are being saved. And Jesus told them one time, he said, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree on anything you ask for, it will be done for you in my name by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, I'm there. When you call the roll, you can call Jesus' name first because he said, I am there. So spiritual formation does not take place in a vacuum. That's why you gotta watch this TV and stuff and try to make it your church. Ain't no fellowship in the TV. <laughs> Jesus wants you to worship with me, smelly and ugly and poor as I am. Sit down there with me and worship with me and treat me nice and respect me. And I have lived long enough to see them come out of darkness into the marvelous light. Some of them couldn't read their name in boxcar letters. I had a group of elders and young men trying to teach them a little preaching homiletics since Elder Mosley taught us, I'm going to teach homiletics. I get out, I'm going to be a teacher. And, and some of them kind of pitiful. And, and one brother was trying, we were trying to read the, the week of prayer. I said, now I got to go, I got all these churches. I want you to read the week of prayer here and you read it, read it, read it next night and I'll be back the next night. And I said, now let's read it. And one of them read and said, and the Lord said, hard word. <laughs> That's all he could say was hard word. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you 
that if you work with them and help them and lead them and guide them and prompt them, encourage them. After a while, I went and preached somewhere else. You know, we're all moving these preachers. And you come back a few days, years later, and that man is up saying, and God said in his word, yes, sir. preaching just like you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Family of God, yes. our prayers are formed and shaped by the needs and the challenges that confront us on a daily basis, individually and as a community. And the context is the stuff that life is made of. The duties that lie at hand. One man said, I could really preach if I were freed up from all this dull labor. That's where you learn to preach. Huh? John Wesley had some of the boys, the preacher boys, and took them down in the marketplace. And, and they had some of these women that they called the fish, fishmongers or whatever they call them. And they had expressions that split the air, the blue notes and everything else. And, and some of his boys got so righteous. That he says, stay, Sammy, and learn to preach. Yeah. Hmm? Learn to preach with the people. Yeah. You visit them in the home. Yeah. Sit down. Don't have your nose up. Yeah. Give you a glass of water, drink it. Yeah. Lo Holy Ghost ain't gonna let you get poisoned with it. <laughs> and then you learn how to talk to the people. There I was in New York, Philadelphia kid and talking, uh, you know all that foolishness and then trying to be pretty and everything and elder f l peterson yeah. took me aside one time said you better open your mouth and preach <laughs> he said these people go to sleep on you <laughs> quit trying to be cute he said <laughs> <laughs> so the holy spirit sets the agenda how shall we pray what shall we pray for a people who are in touch with the great high priest are always in solidarity with each other. The Holy Spirit prompts our prayers, telling us what to pray for. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how to pray like we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He who searches our hearts and minds, he knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit's with the will of God. Well, this is something that we have had to learn. I have had to learn. I've had to learn to be one of the people. Easy to get to, it's easy to imagine yourself above the people. You can put on that New York strut all you want. To, but that ain't gonna help you in the deathbed hour. And you're a great preacher, yeah? You're a tremendous preacher. You're, got a, you're an orator of the first magnitude. But when Mother Jones is sick and she can't get well, her mind begins to go around the preachers that she knows. It's, it's not the most eloquent man in the pulpit, but the man she knows is in touch with God. <laughs> he may not have the best grammar, and syntax and choice of words but when he talks to God you know and so ah, I think you better tell their children I think you better go get Deacon so and so to pray for me <laughs> yes so this has a powerful effect and nobody is out of God's reach Nobody is out of God's reach. This is good. Pleases our Savior, Timothy, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. As verse 5, this kind of prayer focus increases the heart capacity. Hmm? 
Uh, some people treat the people as though they were just tolerating them. But you're dealing with souls that have possibilities of a life that measures with the life of God. This kind of prayer, I say, focus, uh, in this prayer focus increases the heart capacity of the church and tunes us in on heaven's wavelength. It takes us out of ourselves and it rids us of exclusivity. We're not an exclusive club. Nassar, the master said, whosoever will, yes. let him come. Yes. Now, we don't need to get a little t disturbed tonight because I'm going to raise a tirade against anybody. But there was a time when, when at one time they, they said, well, we don't know if we can let that, those kinds of people in our church. Well, you know, two or three stories and and each story has another sequel to it, you know. But uh, the preachers invent them as they go along. But uh, one of them goes like this. Uh, the, the little sexton wanted to become a member of the church and the dicty people in the church, I keep using that word dicty, but the, you know, up the people in the church didn't, didn't want to be bothered with this brother. He's just a little, uh, they call him in those days, sex. The network is giving us a little bit of trouble. Okay. That's fine. We can stop right there. And um, um, let's quickly discuss this. Uh, this is one of our best preachers we had. He, unfortunately, he's now late. I have the privilege of speaking to his daughter at the general conference. Um, Dr. Uh, Pastor Dr. Bradford was one of my favorite preachers um, at Oakwood. A statue of him, a statue of Dr. C.D. Brooks and Elder E. e. Cleveland. Those are some of the best preachers we've had in the church. Uh, but you heard there he taught homiletics also, but he he learned homiletics under the best Elder Mo Mosley at Oakwood College, or that Oakwood College now it's Oakwood University. But uh, these are the preachers um some of the best icons we've ever had but um there are some points that i picked up and i would like to hear from your side as far as introduction is concerned uh sky is still here That's the first time still here. yeah um what did you pick up as far as the introduction was concerned did you pick up anything Yes, Dr. Arani was uh, doing his, his introduction. It's, his quoting was like he's more, more reliant on prayer and uh, for the church to be helping him pray. He says he's like the people to be excited at his sermon, but he'll, he'll prefer people to pray more. That means he leans more on prayer, he's dependent more on prayer, he's overemphasizing the church to be a prayerful church. Thank you. Um, sister, what did you pick up as far as the introduction and then um, the linking of the introduction with the text and the body from introduction to body, the transition linked to the text? What did you pick up? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, James. Um, actually, he took it as, as easy. I didn't see that he has yet begun. Um, but uh, um, you're a bit soft, James. Is there any way you can up the volume? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. 
Can you hear me now? All right. Yeah, but you still sound far away. Maybe closer to the phone or your. Maybe I should just type. Yeah, yeah. You sound no. You sound better when you come closer to the phone. Speak closer to the mic. Oh, okay, okay. So I was saying that um, his introduction was so smooth that he made sure that he had the, that uh, proximity with the audience. That. Uh, he made sure that the church uh, there's that cordial proximity and um, it, he did not ramble around or try to uh, make uh, a lot of uh, 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 preliminaries or announcements whatsoever but he, he was so focused to his uh, and uh, on the transition between the, the introduction and also the, the body, I think one thing that I noted that is, is that he, he was focusing much on prayer and the need for having a church that is prayerful as a weapon to uh, achieve our uh, God-given commission. All right. Um, anyone else want to say something about the introduction, the text, uh, tying it with the body, the transition there? Anyone? Before I make a comment. All right. Uh, on my side, I had him mentioning on just on the introduction there that actually for the for that topic which he came with, he, he heard it from a radio. Some minister was talking about, you know, uh, he wants a, ch a praying church. And that's how he introduces, how he gets the topic. Then he asks uh, the church members to always be praying with him. Then from there, that's when then he he takes that scripture which thank talks you. of okay yes thank you very very well observed thank you that is very important um what he does there is he is saying you wish he had a praying church right that's a topic and he says he regrets having announced his topic beforehand um but what he does is saying that we need to know who we are, right? So he speaks about the church. The church needs to know who we are as a church. But then he ties the text, the preaching text, through first moving from who we are as a church and then coming to a personal experience. Important. A personal experience. He heard the title from someone else. So he's speaking about a personal experience. So that arouses interest when you speak about a personal experience. Do you understand? So, and <clears throat> he ties that personal experience with the church, with the text. And he moves on to say, to applying to the church. He says, somebody, I wrote down, he says, somebody needs to what? Slap you at some times and say, hey, wake up. You are a child of God. <laughs> but speaking about who we are. So what I'm trying to say here is that I'm trying that we must take note of the topic or the theme the introduction, how the preacher introduces. It's like when you are entering a home, you first come through the porch, right? And then you come and knock, and then you enter inside the house, the body. But the porch cannot be too long. The introduction cannot be too long. It's short, but there is a, an aesthetic. The, the porch and the house, <laughs> must have a symbiotic. There must be a synchronism 
There must be a harmonious whole. There must be a congruence. And this is how he, 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 he starts his sermon. It's, you know, it's important for you as, a, as a, a students of homiletics to note those things in any preacher and, and make notes and, and jot him down and, and analyze him. How is he starting? How is he moving? How is he flowing into the text? Right? As far as uh, figures of speech, style, what did you pick up? Anything you picked up? Any words you picked up? Figures of speech? Yes, Prof. We are. Yes, we are. We are the. We are the helpers, you know, of assistants of. of we are the assistants of Christ. Yes, of an assistant of Jesus Christ, right? Right. Yes, Prof. From my side, I found uh, like the one that I found interesting was the one for figure out dime to rub against. Another dime. It's yes, like, thank uh, you. I've written it out. I wrote, I wrote it down. Thank you. Yeah. That's right. Rub. It's dime to rub another dime. Yes, I got it. I also wrote it down. Well done. Another one? Humdrum. What you know about this one, Prof? The one that says uh, CEO of a top firm in the universe. I'm thinking it's an anthrop. Homophism. Which one? I don't know. The Which CEO one? of the top firm in the universe. Yes, you could, you could, you could see it in that way, um, uh, because he's making God uh, uh, a human in that way. Uh, yeah. Uh, Theo uh, and 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 anthropomorphism. Yes, you 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 are absolutely right. I thought about that too, uh, because you yeah. you are making God. Uh, linking him as a man or treating him as a human yes. being. Well done. And the part that, that God is an equal opportunity employer. Yes. Mm. Excellent. And then the humdrum. Did you pick up that? The humdrum. And then um, he, 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 and then he says, he called you and installed you. Did you pick up that? He says, God, he yes, called yes. you and installed you. What is that? Called you and installed you. What is that, Sister Trudy? Called you and installed you. What is that? In the figure of speech, what is it? Okay. Installation is a big word uh, because you can okay. download. Uh, you can download Called the software. You. Installed you. What is that? So, I'm saying um, installing is a big word in uh, IT. Actually, um, when you download a software. Uh, it's useless if you didn't install it. So God not only called us, but he installed us so that we are operational. Uh -huh. We are functional. Yeah, but in, in as a figure of speech, what kind of sp figure of speech is that? Called you. Hey, I'm listening. Hey, okay. I That's think it, it has right? to be an That's alliteration. Yes, alliteration, repetition of the same letter or sound at the beginning of words. Okay. Figures of speech. You must take note of those things. Gonna come into your test. 
Okay. There's another right. one I saw. Pro, uh, yes, what did you pick up? The one that way you quoted uh, LNGY, but he said coming and going like a door on its hinges. Yes, on like like a door. It's similarly on, yes. on its hinges. Yes, you're right. Yes. Thank you very much. And then he came there with uh, something which was M4. My name, my name, my name. Respect me. Trust me. You remember that when he said that? That's correct. You remember that part? I recorded that. You must take note of these ingredients. These are important because, look, it sounds natural and it sounds, we enjoy it. You see how the audience is. He's got the audience eating out of his hands. But you know what? He's a, he knows what he's doing. The ingredients there, tricks. He's, he's put some, some food on the hook <laughs> to catch them. They're just enjoying, enjoying, but he's got them hooked. Mm. He's got ingredients he prepared, you see. It's not coincidental, but intentional. And as far as uh, delivery, what did you pick up? As a hint, he even said something about it. What did he say? Anybody? He spoke about his voice. He said, hey, I must not, I must be careful that I don't have an accident here about shouting too much and so forth. Because as far as delivery is concerned, you must, we here, we're dealing with what? Also voice, right? And memory, under memory, what did you pick up? Yeah, he had some manuscript. Not. Had some what method that he was following of delivery did he use? He uses manuscript, that's correct. And he saw that he's not shy, he's not shy in our time ever. Um, he's not ashamed, so he shows his audience that he's using like that size of paper, you know, big paper. Now, there's another preacher you will hear of him, Dr. C.D. Brooks. C.D. Brook also, a graduate from Oud, a contemporary of Charles Bradford. He uses also manuscript, but you will not know that he is using manuscript. You, you will not see it. The way he holds the Bible, he sets his Bible in that fashion, like that, and his notes here, or just beneath his Bible, you'll never see the notes. Very seldom. Sometimes you may, because today especially they have these pulpits which are, are transparent can see through or translucent can see through with a gloss but uh thank you so much lady and gentlemen you've been excellent students and observers and i like the way you have you have picked up all these ingredients um i don't know if it was kaya or whether it was kwata but i wanted to say share this with you because it is important uh, about the difference between a textual sermon, an expository sermon, and a topical sermon. Even um, homileticians, those who teach homiletics, sometimes have a, a problem with this, they don't understand. I had to correct my professor at Southern Adventist University and his whole class, <laughs> because um, they seem to have confused what a textual sermon is. Now, textual sermons, you can write down the notes, um, use a passage of scripture as the basis of the message in, from which you jump off. Do you understand? So you will use what? You will use Fascinating. a text or use a passage of scripture as the basis for your message from which you take off from, right? Now, it, you, 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 now you may not necessarily stick to that text. You may jump to other texts to support that, quoting all lot of texts. That's why it's textual. Um, but here's the difference with an expository sermon. An expository sermon follows a book of the Bible in order. 
And each chapter determines the thesis of the sermon. So you will have a chapter of, let's say, in Matthews, and that chapter will determine the theme or the thesis of that sermon. But now the expository sermon is the best form of sermon. What it does is you, you will have done all the necessary background of that book because it will concentrate on that specific book. And then it's in relation to other books. If you're preaching from Matthew, you will know there's one of the Gospels. So you look at all the other Gospels. And you look at the background and you'll do comparison. It's, it requires a thorough diligence of homework. This is a seat on which you cannot fall asleep. Uh, it goes as far as determining as to what prompted the writer, what led to him writing, what did he have in his mind, what was he thinking, where was he sitting, what was the purpose of his writing, what did he say, and what did he mean, and how do I apply it today? Was he sitting on a chair? Was he drinking coffee? Was he eating when he wrote? In which language did he write? Did he write himself or did someone else write? He merely just dictated. You know, today um, I do that. I dictate my message, my letter, and it will say from Dr. Jones, but you find I didn't write it. My PA wrote it or typed it, but it's from me. So an expository sermon goes into all that great deal and will come into the context of the text and then will then explicate and expose the text, ex expository, exposition. It will expose the text, will go into the meaning of the word in its original language and, and tell us what it meant then, what it means today. How can we apply today? Very important. And then a topical sermon. Most preachers today, the contemporary world, all these famous preachers we see on television and everywhere, they are using the most useless form. I don't like that word, useless, but the weakest form of preaching. And that is what? Topical sermons. Topical sermon, you just have a topic and then you speak on that and you look for text to support your topic. Um, I don't like that. It is the worst form of uh, preaching. And uh, unfortunately, we're living in a world where people have itching ears. Most preachers use that. And that is a sign to me that that preacher is a lazy man because, uh, you know, he just merely takes a topic and just gets text to support what he's saying. Um, and the, so he, he, he doesn't have a text which then naturally from the text speaks to us, but he has what is called a pretext. So he first has an idea and then he looks for a text. Whereas an expository sermon is where the text itself will allow for a message to come out. Your, your ideas will then be influenced or emanate from the text, not the other way around, where you first have an idea and then you have the text. Then it's not a, a preaching text, it is a pretext. Very important in homiletics to remember that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, I want to refer you to the book by William Evans and look at the back of the book, starting from uh, page 125. There you will see he gives an example of textual sermons, and then he gives an example also of expository sermons, and he gives an example of Bible readings. Uh, which would be then topical sermons. So look at this book. It gives an example or examples. And I would encourage you to procure a copy for you. This is a classic um, where you can always remember when you draw up your sermons to ensure that you follow those principles of how to draw up your sermon in terms of structure. So whether you are using a, a full script or whether you are using an outline, Make use of that. And if you have questions, call on me. I'm here to assist you and make sure that you become 
a fine preacher. I want you to come out of here being top preachers. And um, mm -hmm. if uh, we're still discussing with, uh, I'm still discussing with the leaders of uh, Scriptura, I would like us to really get to the point where we do homiletics too, even if we uh, just do part of it. But I would like you to, to actually practice and deliver a sermon. Uh, and we're going to do some recordings of these sermons. How's that? Anybody in the Amen. house? Amen. So I'm very proud of you for having stuck through and, and hanging in there. Um, it's, it doesn't happen overnight, but I, I know that you are now already smart students. I can hear by your reasoning and the way you identify elements of preaching. This will make some of the guys in the various universities and institutions, they'll be ashamed because they don't follow or are not taught these things. But I know what I teach them there, and it is actually very sad. Very, very sad. I wish um, we had more students getting to learn the real art and science of preaching. Anybody want to pre pray for us before we close? Anyone wants to pray for us? Yes, I can pray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Holy bow heads, blessed and holy Father, creator of everything. Yes. Heaven is your throne, the earth is your footstool. Father, we thank you for the powerful words, for the anointed learning that of Father that we have got in this day. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that assures us always, who's our teacher, our Lord. We thank you for our dear doctor. Continue blessing him, giving him strength, giving him, O oh Lord, all the the knowledge and the information and the revelation and the passion for the things of the gospel. Even as he yes. teaches us, O oh Lord, that we go here therefore and make disciples of all nations ourselves as the word declares. We thank you even for his family, O oh Lord, that will bless them. Bless each yes. and every one of us, family, O oh Father, as we seek and we follow the truth. That, O oh Father, in mm -hmm. everything, your name will be exalted. In the name above every name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I want to encourage you to focus on expository preaching. Alan